Turn to Genesis 9. <clears throat> uh, it's been a, been a little while before I was with you on a Sunday night, so I'm going to back up a little bit. I like teaching this because this is the world we live in, and um, it represents a, a very, very important spiritual thing. I was preaching this morning, we're fighting against sin, we're struggling, we're striving against sin. And it, and it takes work. And we know what we're battling. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. And all of these spirits and entities that we're battling against, they are all beasts. They're animals. They, they, they are not human, they don't think like humans, they don't have a free will like humans, they have a, whatever God made them to be, that's what they are. And they, they, they can't change that nature. So in Genesis 9, God is teaching us a dual thing. Number one, God has given man dominion over the things of this earth. The grass belongs to us. The trees are ours. We can cut them down if we want to. We can grow them if we want to. We can plant whatever we want to. That's ours. God gives property. I believe that. Communism takes property away from man. God gives property to man. When he said, thou shalt not steal, he meant it. God gives things and lets us own things. So we have dominion. The animals out there are under our authority, our dominion. We can kill them at will. It's not wise to bring them to extinction. It's not wise to do that. We nearly wiped out all the buffalo and they finally had to put a stop to that and say, you know, quit killing buffaloes. But they're ours. So the Bible says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And then he said, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. And this is where we count, shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Four things. And that's telling you that it's related to Ephesians 6, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. But the only way that we, you and I, can have authority over spirits is for Christ to be with us and in us. If he's not there, you, have, you cannot have any authority over them. And they'll, they'll tear you apart. They will tear you to pieces. They'll destroy your life. Amen. They've tried. So you know how true that is. Uh, let's go to prayer. Father, I pray, Lord, you'd guide us in our thoughts. Help us, help us, Father, to understand your word the way it is. Father, give us wisdom. Help us to see the, the world that we cannot see through the pages of the Bible. To understand how devils work. What their nature is. What they're afraid of. Where they like to live. What they do to us. Help us understand that through the pages of your word and Father, just through, the, through seeing the, the life that's in this earth, because it's a picture of it. So, Father, open our eyes, give us wisdom in our hearts. We love you and we thank you for this beautiful book. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, Ezekiel, I've covered this, so I'm not going to mention it much, but Ezekiel 1 gives us a glimpse of the living creatures that are in heaven. Ezekiel calls them living creatures. John calls them in Revelation, beasts. So we know that a big portion of the angelic realm are beasts. When Jesus comes back, he's riding on a horse. But he's, he's not riding a horse that died and went to heaven. It's not Trigger from Roy Rogers. Okay, It's not Roy Rogers' horse. It's not the Lone Ranger's horse, Silver. It's not anything like that. It is, a, it is an angelic creature that God made, that exists in the spiritual realm. And the Bible tells you about horses, that they're not afraid to go to battle, go, not afraid to go to war. So I'm not going to cover all that again. Uh, we, and we know that the, the devil characterized Genesis chapter 3 as a serpent. In Revelation chapter 12, he's characterized as the serpent, the devil, Satan, the dragon, so that tells us that Satan has a beast nature about him. But he's very wise. He can speak. He knows how to talk. He knows how to communicate. He knows how to tempt. 
He knows what the Bible says. The Bible, it tells us in Ezekiel 28, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. So we know the serpent has a great wisdom about him, but his wisdom then was corrupted because of his pride. He knows what the Bible says, but he doesn't believe it. And there are some things that God hides from these spirits that they cannot see too far into the future. I think they can see somewhat. But they cannot see. We know that they could not see Jesus dying on the cross being the one thing that destroys all the power of the enemy. They could not see that. The Bible says that. They were not allowed to foretell that by killing Jesus, they themselves were going to be doomed forever. Had they, had they known that, they would have never crucified Jesus. Okay? So they are limited in their knowledge of events that are both happening now and events that happen in the future. They, they, I believe they can see a little bit into the future, but I think it's very limited, okay? Um, and this verse, James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So I mentioned that story about facing off with a wolf. If you run from a wolf... You've lost. That wolf runs faster than you. He'll bite your heels and cause you to fall. And when you lay, you're laying on the ground, he knows where your neck is. I've watched enough YouTube videos of lions to know that lions instinctively know where a neck is. And on these great big musk oxes that they sometimes go after, those lions know to put their mouth over the mouth of one of these young musk oxes, one of these young buffaloes, so that the buffalo cannot breathe and it cannot cry out for help from the herd. Those lions know that. And in their instincts, they know to go either for the throat or to cover their mouth with their mouth to suffocate them and to keep them from crying out. It's amazing. Amazing. If you study any part of the animal kingdom, I guarantee you, you will be so fascinated at their nature and you'll ask the question, how is it that this evolved to be this way? And then you'll realize that's the stupidest thing in the world is to think that that all evolved that way. It was created. God did it on purpose. And God made these devils, these fallen angels, these evil gods, these beasts, he made them to be a certain way. They have a nature you study the Bible, you'll study their nature, you'll learn things, okay? <clears throat> Luke chapter 4, when the devil ended all temptation, he departed from him for a season. So that's what James said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And Jesus resisted him and the devil left. And then I have this picture up here and we're going to kind of move on. Matthew 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Notice God is using an animal comparison. Who in here has ever raised chickens? Anybody ever raised chickens? Have you, have you seen a mama chicken bring the brood together? Michaela and I, she was riding with me over here one day, and we coming down American Legion Drive, and we saw a big raccoon, and three baby raccoons coming right behind her. That was the mama and the three babies. And Michaela was going, oh, look at that. It's like little ducks. Instinctively, that mama knows to protect those little raccoons. And those raccoons know to follow mama. Instinctively, they know this. They didn't, they didn't learn that from millions of years of mistakes and accidents. It was written into them. God put it in them to be that way. Okay, so watch this. Verse 38. God would have gathered Jerusalem as a hen would gather her chicks together under wings. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, shall not see me henceforth till you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And I always like to use this illustration of a house that's left desolate. There was an old house next to my uncle. My uncle, my aunt and uncle lived next to my grandma and grandpa down in Jacksonville, Arkansas. And next to them was this old house. And I always wondered what was in that old house. And finally, me and my sister and my cousin 
we kind of broke in over there and got into that old house. And, buddy, that was creepy. And we heard sounds and stuff and scratching and scurrying. And I said, let's get out of here. And here's the point. Just as in a house, if it's not lived in by people, creatures will move in. In any church or any family or any person, you are a house of God. The Bible says that. This is the house of God. When Christ is not living and dwelling in this house, those are going to move in. They're going to move in and they're going to rule in that house. You understand that? So do you understand now why some lost people act the way they do? And why sometimes you get around certain people, David, and you just get this feeling from them like something ain't right. And it's because the spirit that's in you is telling you that the spirit in them is evil. And the spirit of them knows that Jesus is in the room. And they get very agitated. Okay? That may be why that guy called me a racist. Okay? I, I guarantee you he had a spirit or spirits dwelling in him that has shaped his mind. And fed him a, a big barrel of lies and he believes every one of them. And as long as those spirits are there, they, that's how it's going to be. But I guarantee you, the moment uh, somebody like that gets saved, those spirits are gone. And I've told this story before, but there was a young lady. We went to a preaching conference out in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And a man was there. He was a pastor in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. And he was a high school math teacher and a pastor. And he was teaching his high school class. And there was a foreign exchange student there from Germany. And... Something was going on. This girl was not getting along well with the family that she had moved in with. And it was, it was getting bad. She was probably going to go back to Germany. But she, she sort of liked this math teacher, not in a sensual way, but just was drawn to his character. And they, they knew the family that this girl was living with and they understood the situation. Well, they applied to whoever runs the student exchange to have this girl moved into their house, and she moved into their house. But the man told her, he said, now listen, I'm a pastor of a church. You move in this house, we have rules. We pray before we eat. We pray when we go to bed. And we go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And as long as you live in our house, you're going to church. Now, I can't make you be a Christian, but you're going to church. So she did. And she got saved. And she was at that meeting and she testified. She said, you know, we are taught in Germany that we, everything's about evolution. We came from monkeys. We came from lower life forms and we evolved and there is no God. And God had nothing to do with it. And she said, the day that I got saved, I read Genesis 1 and believed every word of it. See, the old spirits left. And a new spirit was in her, and she just believed the Bible. Just believed, just like that. Boom. And she said, I want everybody here to pray for me. And I mean everybody just put hands on her and prayed on her. Because she said, I'm fixed. I have to go back to Germany. And she said, there's no place to go to church over there that I know of right now. Pray that I find a godly church to go to. So I never forgot that story as long as I live. Turn to Isaiah chapter 13. <clears throat> Let me show you this. So think of that house. And think of Babylon. There's two cities in the Bible. Jerusalem, Babylon. They're opposite one another. Jerusalem's the holy city. Babylon's the harlot. So think of Babylon could be anything. So people always ask, well, I, I think Babylon's a Catholic church. Well, Babylon is the Catholic church. But Babylon is a lot of other things as well. Any place where God is not, that's Babylon. So Isaiah 13, 19. Babylon, 
the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. When God got done with Sodom and Gomorrah, who lived there? Nobody. Eliminated every one of them. And he said, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Now, I believe that they've found the place where Sodom and Gomorrah was. And it's a place that when I say it gets no rain, I'm telling you, it never rains there. I mean, nothing. So there's no animals that live there. There's no grass that grows there. People don't live there because there's nothing there to live on. And God meant what he said. Now watch this. But watch what moves in. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there. Now think when he said beast, think devils, think spirits. Think of anybody's life when Jesus has exited. When they kick Jesus out, and they kick the Bible out, kick the spirit out, wild beasts move in. Wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. So think about that house. Desolate, being full of bats, rats, possums, you name spiders everywhere. Doleful creatures. Owls. Owls are a type of spirit. They have wings. Okay? Owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. Now that's a funny word. Because in mythology, a satyr... Is sort of like how? Half man, half goat, or half beast. A man's torso and head with a beast, a horse, or a goat's body, four legs. Now, I don't know that that's exactly what that is, but I know the word satyr, that Hebrew word, sair, is used in another place, and it was translated devils. So God's telling you, these are devils that are moving in. No matter what they look like, they're moving in. Satyrs shall dance there. The wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come and her day shall not be prolonged. So what happens? In a person's life, or let's say a church, uh, we have a family that comes down every now and then from O'Fallon. They said they were going to a church and... Boom, all of a sudden, they start using different Bibles in there. And they talk to the pastor, and the pastor say, well, you know, we're just you're letting them read what they want to read. And you know what they did? They left. So we're not going to have that. Because whether they realize it or not, as they start pushing, see, the preacher would preach out of the King James, mostly, but got everybody else reading different Bibles. And it won't be a matter of time until that pastor will be using some of the Bible. And when that happens, that's when the dragons will move in. Because the presence of Christ is not there. So apply that to a church. Apply it to your life. Apply it to your family. When Christ is gone, the beasts will show up and they will terrorize you. They will draw you into sin. They will drag you into evil. And it will be by the grace of God if God ever lets you come back. How many has come back before? You know exactly what I mean. But I've seen people go and never come back. Mark chapter 1. Tell you what, let's go in order. Matthew chapter 8 first. Let's go in order. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Look at how these devils respond to Christ. Matthew 8, 28. When he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils. This is not the same story as the Gadarenes. It is a different occasion, a different story. Some say... Well, that's the same story, but the, the text, in the text, somebody wrote it wrong. I don't believe that. Rule number one, there's no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, 
Somebody says there is one, you go back to rule number one. No mistakes in the Bible. So this is a different story. It's not the same Gadarenes story. Two men possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fears, so that no man might pass by that way. When a person has those kind of de I'm telling you, these guys were eat up. They were monsters. And everybody knew it. Where did they live? Tombs with the dead. Man, I'm telling you. That generation of young people, I, I don't know if it's still a thing now, but back years ago, we had a young lady that went to our school and then she left. And a couple years later, her mama wanted to put her back in. She was thinking about putting her back in. She had already gothed herself. She was wearing the black fingernail polish, black makeup, black lips, black everything, black clothes. Why? She was cutting herself. Why? These devils love death. And they always accompany themselves with death. Watch out for some of these movies that you watch. These when I was young, all these horror movies started, you know, Jason and the Friday the 13th and Halloween and Freddy the Krueger and all that. That's when all that was coming out. And boy, I thought those movies were cool. That was all about death. Evil stuff. Evil wicked things. That's devils. So that no man might pass that way. And behold, they cried out saying, What have we to do with thy, thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Look at how they responded just to the presence of the Word of God. Because that's what Jesus is. They knew it. They knew who He was. And they knew what power He had over them. They knew that He could have snapped His fingers or said something. And those devils would have been put in the bottomless pit. They knew it. Now turn to Mark chapter 1. Next one over. Mark chapter 1. I'm telling you. You look at how these things respond. Mark chapter 1. Verse 23. And there was in their synagogue a man. Notice, notice what it says about him. An unclean spirit. Name an animal that's unclean pigs why did God not want them to eat those things they were unclean pigs are dirty you wash a pig what's he going to do go right back to the mud okay filthy unclean nasty things and that's what this spirit was this man had an unclean spirit about him and I want to tell you something. These, some of these young people living in the chop zone, one thing that was noted was these people were dirty people. They didn't, they didn't bathe. You know what dreadlocks, you know how that is? You don't comb the hair. That's how that happens. You just don't wash it, don't comb it, and it'll twist up like that that's that's unclean and then when they finally run all those people out and they had to spin and i think they're still doing it cleaning up that area trash and feces and spray paint everywhere why would anybody want to live in that i'm telling you they had unclean spirits in them Spirits that, let's just say it like this, think dirty, talk dirty, live dirty. And defile one another in filthy ways. Okay? This man had an unclean spirit. And he was in the synagogue. Boy, think about that. That tells you that the word of God wasn't in that place until Jesus showed up. And he cried out saying, let us alone. So that tells you that there's more than one in there. Let us alone. 
What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? They know what he's capable of doing. They can, he can destroy them. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Here is an unclean spirit saying he's the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, Hold thy peace, come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, he cried with a loud voice and he came out of him. Boom! Why? Jesus said it. He told him to leave. Get out! Jesus, I'm telling you, Jesus and this book has power. And devils don't want anything to do with it and they will fight you tooth and nail over this book and over the spirit of Christ living in you, the word of God abiding in you. But it's got power over them and they know it. So why, why do these churches, why are they abandoning the word of God? Devils are leading them. Devils are leading the congregation, leading the, the pastors, leading them to abandon the word of God so they can move in. Now that the word of God is not there, they're, they're all over the place. Let's darken this sanctuary. Let's turn all the lights off. Let's meditate. Let's empty our minds so we can create a space for God. And they do all these weird practices. That's devils. Luke chapter 4. Turn there. Luke chapter 4. This is, I think, the same story worded a little bit different. If you look in uh, verse 33, And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. So it sounds like the same story. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and heard him not. In verse 36, look at what it says. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. And what was it that they marveled at? His word. And think about it. Death. I believe what the Bible says about death. Satan has the power of death. So who killed Lazarus? Satan did. Satan took his life. Okay? And Jesus knew it. So he waits four days. Then he goes to the tomb. And how does he make him come back to life? Lazarus come forth. That was that simple. He didn't do a little dance, shake beads, pound a drum, okay, wave a f you know, fire thing around. He didn't do some ritual. He just said, Lazarus, come forth. And boom, instantly death released its grip on Lazarus and everything about Lazarus was made whole again and he lived again. I, that story still amazes me. How Jesus' word has power even over the last enemy, and that's death. I want to die with scripture coming out of my mouth. I don't know if that's going to happen. But if God's given me a choice, I want to die with scripture. I want it to be a testimony. That I believe God's word. And death, if you, if any of you see me die, I want you to know that death has no power over me. I'm not dead. I'm in a better place, but I am not dead. Think that way. Because that's true. Psalm 22, look at this. Here's Jesus on the cross. Boy, Psalm 22 is powerful. And by the way, that's the 500th chapter of the Bible. 
Psalm 22, 500, yeah, 500th chapter of the Bible. Five is the number for death. Five is the number for death. So this is the 500th chapter of the Bible, and look what it talks about. It talks about the death of Christ on the cross. It foreshadows it. Because it starts out saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those are the exact words Jesus said. He said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthami. But he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the Jews sit, are standing around there. They were confused. They had a spirit of confusion on them. And they were not, they could not translate what he said. Had they known what he said, they would have said, he's quoting Psalm 20. Oh, look, they pierced his hand. Oh my goodness, they pierced his hands and feet. Look at it. They parted his garments and cast lots for his vesture. Look at that. He's fulfilling the word of God. They would have known it. They would have known it. But God hid it from them. See it? So look at, at and then he said, um, oh, let's see here. Ver, look at verse 5. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despise of all the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him. And that's what they did to Jesus on the cross. If you're the son of God, come down from there. That's what they said. They did exactly what the prophet said they were going to do. They were mocking him and scorning him. And then if you look down... Um, uh, verse 17, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. That's exactly what happened. Now, look at verse 12. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round about. There, what they could not see was at the hill of Golgotha on the day Christ was crucified. He was surrounded by devils, bulls. There are devils that look like bulls and calves. You see it in Ezekiel 1, Revelation 4. And what, what did Israel make in the wilderness? Calf. That was their devil, God. That was the devil that they worshipped. A false god. It looked like a bull. And so there at the cross... Jesus is surrounded by evil spirits. And those evil spirits just waiting for him to die because they think that they're going to win the victory when Jesus dies. And then it said, verse 13, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Now we got lions. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Look at here, verse 16. Dogs have compassed me. Now we have dogs. What did the Egyptians worship? What was one of their gods? Anubis. It looked like a jackal. Okay. Did, that, did they just make that up? No. They knew, the spirit that was in them knew what shape and what form these devils were taking. They were beasts. And those beasts knew that when Jesus dies, they have now, they have nothing to worry about, they have nothing to fear, and they're going to take over. But he rose again. And they were not expecting that. For dogs have compassed me. And if you read Revelation, what is not allowed in heaven? Dogs. Dogs are not allowed. Dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. There's a prophecy right there. So who pierced his hands and feet? The people did, but it was the devils causing them to do it. You believe that? How did Judas end up betraying Christ the night of the Last Supper? Satan entered into him directly and took over him. And Judas now is owned and possessed by the devil himself. And he has no power, no will whatsoever. He's going to do this and there's no doubt about it. Because these beasts don't change their mind. I, I, I can remember years ago in my youth wondering, well, wouldn't it be neat if, if Satan got saved? That would be cool, wouldn't it? Satan gets saved. Man, that I had no idea that there's no chance at all that Satan is going to be anything other than what he is. And to think at one time 
that spirit was in us. Causing us to do the things that we did before we were saved. That's Ephesians chapter 2. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Uh, let me tell you something. We're finding out now that we got a president that's actually doing something about it. All the pedophiles are getting arrested. And it's surprising now who the pedophiles really are. Wait till we find out what senators, what congressmen, what judges. Wait till Ghislaine Maxwell starts naming names and giving videos of people in high places pedophiling. Wait till that comes out. That's a spirit in them. Um, let's do this. Genesis chapter 1. Very quickly. Genesis 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Does, does that leave anything out? No. God's given us dominion over this earth. This is ours. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply. That's what he said in Genesis 9. Replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every living thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So here's what I think. Before, before the fall and before Genesis 9, according to this... Everything ate herbs. They were herbivores. During the reign of Christ, what are lions going to eat? Grass. And I've watched lions eat the guts of some of these big cows they kill. With their teeth, they squeeze out the contents. They don't like that grass that that ox ate. They don't like it. They like the guts. They don't, but they squeeze out that grass. They don't eat it. They don't want it. But when Christ comes down to reign, he's going to change them like they were here. They're going to eat grass again. And not us. <laughs> Amen. Now, so God's given man dominion. Deuteronomy 11. Let me go through this. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness of Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall, be your, shall your coast be. Notice that he said, every place wherein the soles of your feet tread. Look at your feet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten toes. That's God giving you dominion. And God said, every place that you walk on, that's your ground. I'm giving it to you. So, why do all these do-gooder tree huggers want to put everybody out of all that land? It goes contrary to the Word of God. It teaches this idea that Gaia, Mother Earth, doesn't like men owning her. Think about that. So, Gaia is Babylon. And she doesn't like men having dominion over her. Like Jezebel. Remember what was at stake? It was Naboth's vineyard, his land. And Jezebel stole it from him, gave it to Ahab. That's her spirit. That's her role. So when Jezebel comes in a church or Jezebel comes in a family, her role is to steal what belongs to the man or God and take it away and hand it over to the devil. So think about it. When God created man, he gave man dominion over the beast. But now in Revelation 13, a beast rises up and now the beast has dominion over the man. 
And most of these tree huggers have it in their mind that the worst plague of this earth is mankind. And they believe that. And they want most of the population of the earth to be gone. And the earth will be better. But that's not what God said. Revelation 10 Here's, I think this is Jesus. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with the cloud and a rainbow was upon his head. His face as it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open. He set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. You know what he's doing? It's mine. I'm taking over. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And, he had, and when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. I believe that's the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what I believe. Okay, but God gave him dominion. Malachi 4, 3, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that, it, that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Look at this. God's giving you dominion. Now listen to me. When you, your personal life, when you are not abiding in the word of God. I promise you, devils are going to eat you up. Every time. When you abide in the word of God, God lets you crush them under your feet. You now have authority and you say, devils, you can't touch anybody. In my family, you can't touch me. Get away. Uh, turn to Romans 16. And then I'll read 1 Corinthians. I'll let you go. Romans 16. Oh, I love this. I love it. Remember what your feet represent. By the way. There's a, there's, a, there's a double thing here. You have ten toes, that's dominion. But in each foot, there are 33 joints. So you have two feet. What does that equal? The Bible. You see it? When you have and are abiding in the word of God, you have dominion. Romans 16, do what? Amen. Romans 16, where is it? Um, may the God of heaven bruise Satan. Yeah, here it is, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Satan. He's going to bruise Satan under your feet. He's going to use the church to do it. What grace is that? What amazing grace is that, that God will let the church bruise Satan because we're his body. And he's going to give us dominion over that. There's another picture of this in, turn to uh, Revelation 12. You remember the two lights that God made? The greater light that rules over the day, the lesser light that rules over the night. What is the lesser light? The moon. So look at Romans 12, or Revelation 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and what's under her feet? And ladies, the moon is related to your cycles. In fact, that word comes from the word for moon. Because they last 28 days, and that's the moon cycle, 28 days. And it's the curse. And God now is giving you authority over that. It's under your feet now. No more curse. Isn't that beautiful? No more curse. And it even, the, the lesser light could let you say, look at the New and the Old Testament. The Old Testament shines, but the New Testament shines brighter than that. So you could say the Old Testament is the lesser light and the New Testament is the greater light. So what did Jesus do? He came and died, rose again, so that we have dominion over the law. The law does not rule over us. We rule over it. Or rule by it. But it, the law has no dominion over us 
anymore. He's put it under our feet. But you have to abide in Christ. And it's very simple. Read this book. Pray. Read this book. Pray. Read this book. Pray. That simple. And then you're abiding in the word and those devils. Mm-mm. They're not going to mess with you because they know who's in you. They can smell him. <laughs> That's Jesus. Get away from him. Amen. It's like wearing aftershave going out deer hunting. Right? Can you put on aftershave and sit out in the deer stand? Them deer smell you a mile away. Woo! That's a human. Get away from there. I recognize that. That's brute. <laughs> Amen. Oh, let's stand to our feet. It, it, I, and I'm, I'm being dead honest. There is a simplicity in Christ, and it's supposed to be simple. Abiding in Christ is nothing more than reading his word, crying out to God. Read his word, cry out to God. Now, that, is, that doesn't mean that God may not let you fight a battle every now and then, because he's going to. But he's teaching you how to win. He's teaching you how to fight. He's teaching you how to, okay, you got overtaken this time, but the next time you know it's not going to work. It's like those video games. You play those video, first time you play a video game, you get shot, right? Within the first 10 seconds, boom! So the second time you play it, you know where that guy is, don't you? So the second time you play it, you go around and boom, shoot him, right? And then you walk a little bit, boom, you get hit by somebody else. So the third time you play it, you know you got to get that guy and that guy. And that's what God's doing. He's taking you and showing you how to fight battles. Because we got a big one coming. Amen? And imagine God using people like Sister Betty Forsythe back there. To be a soldier warrior for Jesus Christ, who God uses to put down the power of Satan. Do you think God can do that in her? Amen, Amen he can. And he will. He will. Father, you bless us. You bless us. Thank you, God, for showing us victory, for showing us your great love for us, for showing us how simple this life really is. Thank you for showing us the dominion of Christ over every evil beast that comes against us. With Jesus in us and us being in Jesus, those devils don't stand a chance. And they never will. So, Father, help us to faithfully abide in you. Teach us how to fight. Teach us how to know warfare. Teach us how to do battle. Make us good soldiers. But always hide us, God, so these devils never, never have victory over us. You've given us dominion. Thank you, Lord, for what you've taught me one day. When I wasn't doing so well. And you whispered sweet peace to me that those devils had surrounded my family and you run them all off. Thank you for that. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.